Today, Melbourne is home to 5.1 million people. It is home to 250 kilometers of a, of a tram line, which is amazing. It has close to 4 million vehicles, which uh, are used across the Melbourne urban landmass. So many clues here as a property investor as to how to invest in the Melbourne marketplace. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. I'm pumped for today's show. We're going to focus on the Melbourne property market and see if we can crack the code of buying real estate in what will become Australia's most populated city. I tell you what, I love Melbourne. I love Victorians. I have a fond spot for absolutely people from Melbourne and the Melbourne property marketplace. We're going to dig into that. Should we do the show? I don't know. We never know until we get to the end. And of course, I am speaking to you today as a married man. Yes, if you've been listening in on past episodes, you're probably across the fact that literally last week, I took the plunge and got myself married. And I tell you what, the day was absolutely spectacular. We were blessed with a beautiful Sydney sunny day and my bride, well, she just blew everyone away with her beautiful look and beautiful dress. It was really a great day. So I tell you what, uh, thanks to everyone for sending me well wishes. Um, It was spectacular. The only downfall was really I almost had to fire the best man He was uh, a bit of a train wreck. As I alluded to last time, I have no idea why we have best men. Uh, They're pretty useless. In fact, I went over to his house to to basically get dressed, uh, thinking he would have some basic utensils for the purpose of getting married. Uh, Did he have an iron to iron my shirt? No, apparently... Uh, irons are not in vogue anymore. Did he have some shoe polish? No, he did not. Did he have a little snack to keep my energy levels high? Uh, No, no, there was no food in the fridge. Uh, In fact, the best man was probably the biggest concern of the wedding. At one stage, I was going to replace him with Marty, the cameraman, who was probably and arguably way more helpful than the best man. I think, uh, yeah, the pressure got to him. Um, Failed at the job, but I tell you what, um, for the rest of the wedding, it was absolutely cracking. Best man, by the way, was the only single person there, and he did actually catch the bouquet, um, which he almost fumbled. It basic, he basically caught it with his chin. That's how, um, how off target he was. But hey, look, we're not here to talk about my wedding. We're here to talk about the Melbourne property marketplace. And I guess a big job for me today is simply sharing information around my experience when it comes to marketplaces, finding capital growth, strong yields, hotspots and lifestyle areas to invest in. And for me, I've been going to Melbourne now as a property deal maker for close to two decades. And I'll tell you what, I really love Melbourne. I think there's so much opportunity in the Melbourne property market. And as a Sydney resident, I find a few things just really cool about Melbourne. Firstly, I find people there just so nice. They're so goddamn nice. People talk to you. When I was a single man, girls talk to you. It was amazing. Uh, The Melbourne market as well, it is something that is pretty special. And I think a lot of property investors need to take HID uh, and get into the Melbourne marketplace. And it's certainly not too late, but it is disappearing. I'll tell you what, one of the things I, I think is most fascinating about Melbourne from a behavioural point of view is that Melbourne is today Australia's largest landmass. It actually occupies close to 2,500 square kilometres. It's big. It is actually as big as London. 
Except Melbourne has 5.1 million people and London has 10.4 million people. There's a lot of clues in that though, isn't there? Mexico City is actually smaller than Melbourne and its residents is uh, equals 20.4 million people. Melbourne is Australia's single largest landmass. It has 5.1 million people in it today, but we can tell uh, from behavioural economics that into the future, Melbourne will be the size of what London is today. It will home be the home to 10.4 million people. And I think this is a critical conversation because when we think about where you move your money to in real estate terms in Australia, there is really a lack of choice of safe marketplaces where you can wake up the day of your retirement and know you've bet on something that is sustainable and has longevity. And when you think about that in Australian terms, we only have five cities which are with over a million people. Two global cities, Melbourne and Sydney, globally recognised, absolute performers when it comes to Australian real estate. Then we've got new world cities, places like Perth and Brisbane, which are fast evolving to become very big places on their own accord. Then we've got Adelaide, which uh, anyone who's been to Adelaide, it's uh, you know, can be quite quiet there. I think I saw a photo of Adelaide before COVID and after COVID, and it looked like the same place. Uh, there was no people anywhere. Then you've got sort of our smaller cities, which are you know great places to own real estate, places like Canberra and Newcastle. But when we think about getting to retirement, it is a nice thought to actually own real estate in some of these big populated areas. Because as my opening statement alluded to, you can wake up 20 years from now and bank on the fact that Melbourne won't be 5.1 million people, it will be closer to 7 million people. In fact, every 10 years, Melbourne really does put on around an extra million people. By 2051, according to the ABS, Melbourne could range between 8 million to 9 million people. And of course, if you're planning on retiring in 20 or 30 years, this is a valuable piece of information. Because as a property investor, if you were to invest in the Melbourne market now, you're already ahead of so many other people. And from a behavioral point of view, if you buy the right location, you're going to own real estate in what will become a very built out suburban urban landscape. In fact, if you go back to look at Melbourne and track its history as a landmass, today compared to, say, 1954 around the Olympics that Melbourne held, the landmass of Melbourne has tripled in size. And the projections are for it to add even more landmass to it. Now, I love this information, which is all gazetted really in Melbourne, uh, Melbourne's town plan, what Melbourne is absolutely aiming for. It is giving us so many clues as a property investor. And of course, behind the scenes, if you go to Melbourne, most people love it. It's full of action, entertainment. It's full of arts, culture, sporting events. It is the cafe capital of Australia. There is so much culture that is in the Melbourne landscape. And really, arguably, Melbourne is well-placed to become the place economy of Australia. In other words, where most visitors really go to when they come to Australia, they think Melbourne, because Melbourne is really a fun place, rather like New York. If you love your urbanity, it is really the number one city when it comes to things to do, nightlife, culture, food, arts, it all happens in Melbourne. And of course, Melbourne is home to the Big Four, which is the Formula One, the Australian Tennis Open, the Melbourne Cup, where 110,000 people gather around a, a, a horse race that stops the nation. And of course, Melbourne is home to the MCG. And yeah, haven't lived if you've never been to the AFL at the MCG. I tell you what, put that one on your bucket list. 
If you've never done it, try and get yourself some tickets to a grand final. You will not experience an atmosphere like it. Today, Melbourne is home to 5.1 million people. It is home to 250 kilometres of a, of a tram line, which is amazing. It has close to 4 million vehicles, which uh, are used across the Melbourne urban landmass. So many clues here as a property investor as to how to invest in the Melbourne marketplace. I think one of the big things, though, is Plan Melbourne. Really, the latest version of Plan Melbourne, I think updated in 2019, tells us what Melbourne will look like in 2050. The day you retire, Melbourne has already set out a plan so that you can make some informed decisions as a property investor on how to invest. In fact, uh, literally, Plan Melbourne is expecting the city of Melbourne to go from 5.1 million people to 8 million people by mid-century. Victoria's population will be 10 million people. And the infrastructure and the planning and the roadmap is all gazetted. We just need, as property investors, to make some big decisions on what that means for us as, as investors. And I tell you what, I think the Melbourne market is a marketplace designed for contrarians. We know there's 4 million cars in the Melbourne greater area. We know there's 5.1 million people. We know the city will reach 8 million people. We actually also know that Melbourne will become Australia's most populated city by 2026. These are so many clues on how we can approach investing in the Melbourne property marketplace. When you think about it, Melbourne is crowded and it is going to continue to be crowded and even after the aftermath of behavioural change through coronavirus, we are seeing that the Melbourne property market is really going to be home to a growing Australian. Immigrants do not move from overseas and flock to small regional Australia. It just does not work like that. In fact, if you're a well-polished engineer or scientist and you're from Europe, the value proposition of Melbourne is a big, big driver because it's got some of the most unique lifestyle benefits as well as economic benefits that you could ever want as an international migrant. Today, people drifting into Australia generally drift into Sydney or Melbourne as the marketplace of choice. And I'll tell you what, I think when it comes to understanding Melbourne, betting against a few behavioural problems that Melbourne has is going to absolutely mean you're going to find wealth from real estate. Think about the absolute uh, gridlock that sometimes Melbourne goes through. Today, many people in Melbourne would spend 60 or 70 minutes traveling one way in the morning and traveling one way in the afternoon just to live in this huge urban landmass. Remember, it is Australia's biggest landmass. And because of that, I think you can find some answers as a property investor and absolutely be a bit of contrarian. If everyone's going to be bottlenecked, why not bet on mobility? If the middle class of Australia is being split in, split in two, why not bet on where the haves are, the inner ring, the middle ring, or the inner outer ring? And of course, when it comes to the idea of living uh, close to, to awesome things, I think behaviourally, uh, Melbourne has it all. You can bet on urbanity and culture and own real estate close to that. It's still affordable enough for property investors to buy culture. Leafy areas, still affordable for many property investors to buy that tree count uh, dynamic of livability in an urban area. The water or beaches areas of Melbourne, a little bit expensive today. Probably most property investors have missed that boat. So you can absolutely get two out of the big three from a lifestyle point of view as to what people want when it comes to investing in the Melbourne property marketplace.
I personally think there is no such thing as a cheap or high-performing asset. And Melbourne is not a cheap property market, but it is a high-performing marketplace. And for that reason, I think most property investors need to absolutely think about getting into the Melbourne property market and owning some real estate. I absolutely think investors are being priced out of the best parts of Melbourne. The inner and middle ring of Melbourne is disappearing. And for property investors, really, 2021 is a crossroads moment for Melbourne. Because much of Melbourne, which is the best pockets of Melbourne, where Melbourneites want to live, is disappearing. And again, this is a cornerstone moment, I think, for many property investors, where the idea of controlling the monopoly board is at stake. In other words, do you really want to wake up in 20 years from now telling your uh, loved ones, your friends and family uh, that you're a property investor and you don't own real estate in Melbourne? That's like going around the Monopoly board and forgetting and landing on Mayfair and not buying it, right? The apex predator of Australian real estate is the Sydney and Melbourne property marketplace. So as a property investor, you've got to get a piece of it because it's kind of fool's gold not to. And the real challenge with Melbourne right now is prices are soaring in value. And of course, this is pushing people into uh, fundamentally C and D grade Melbourne. And again, A and B grade Melbourne is probably where we want to wake up in 20 years owning real estate. So there's still time to find the diamond in the rough in A and B parts of Melbourne. And of course, in Sydney, this has long since disappeared. Today, people shopping in the Sydney property market are shopping as investors typically 30 or 40 kilometres out of the city unless they want to drop a million dollars. Melbourne is going through this transformation where potentially you will look back in 2024 and absolutely wish you had bought in what is considered some of the better suburbs of Melbourne. So we're going to talk through that today. Position versus cycle. Are you better off absolutely getting a piece of Melbourne in one of its more uh, premier locations right now today and jumping on that as a property investor? I certainly think you are because you cannot circle back to a major global city and buy in it any cheaper into the future. We've seen that with Sydney. Once you miss the prestige parts of the marketplace, the A and B parts of the city, you generally only have a choice of buying further and further out and then it becomes, well, questionable whether that's the right thing to even do. Typically, Melbourne is a fast-growing city. In the past, prior to coronavirus, obviously locking the borders, around 120,000 people per annum were being added to the Melbourne uh, city realm. And of course, into the future, Melbourne will resemble a place like New York uh, or London with anywhere from 8 to 9 million people by mid-century. And of course, Melbourne has been voted many times over one of the most livable cities in the world, which of course is built around connectivity, healthcare, employment, the livability factor, affordability, education and infrastructure. Now, again, if you're an international migrant with some skill, you're probably not going to leave the city you live in. Let's say you live in Berlin, Germany, and move to a much more unaffordable location. You're not going to move generally to uh, even a little weird country town. You are looking for something which makes commercial sense. Cities that make commercial sense are generally our biggest cities, but then there is a threshold of where, say, moving from Berlin where the average house price might be four hundred dollars or $500,000, dollars 
you know, you start to think, well, do I really want to move to Sydney where things are just ridiculously expensive? Melbourne has traditionally filled the vacuum for Australia as a place where you can still get affordability, connectivity, healthcare, education, infrastructure, employment, and that livability factor. And for that reason, it is absolutely a cracking marketplace. I tell you what, right now, people are buying in Melbourne hand over fist. And of course, the Victorian government's thrown out a little stamp duty concession, which is driving more people to own real estate in that economy. We are seeing Melbourne absolutely grow in value right now. I tell you what, for Australians, a lot of us see Victoria and Melbourne as the the cousin that got COVID and kind of messed things up for a couple of months here in Australia. But the rest of the world sees Melbourne completely differently. The brand Melbourne value proposition is pretty good because when you think about it, Melbourne is the largest city in the world or the most populated city in the world that stopped COVID in its tracks. No other city with 5 million people caught COVID and stopped it. Only Melbourne did it. And of course, from an international migration point of view, this is pretty, pretty effective when it comes to building the brand of what Melbourne is. Now, of course, Australia's migration has stopped, the borders are closed, and this has a short-term impact on cities like Melbourne and Sydney, where, of course, uh, much of the population grows based on international migration, more skill coming into the economy, reshaping the economy. And really, Australia's forecast to get back on track with more migration is really earmarked for 2023 with a moderate migration movement late 2022. But I think we can all agree in the last 100 years, Melbourne and Sydney have grown the fastest and will continue to do so after coronavirus uh, is fundamentally solved. And I think if we are betting on something, a one in 100 year problem is really just that. If we take away any short term critical thinking around populations being stalled and we look at the medium to long term trends, what we do know when it comes to uh, growth, if we can own real estate where there is high population movement, we're going to end up in a better place into the future. So certainly Melbourne's population uh, rebound is probably more like 2022 or late 2022, 2023. We're going to see this swelling of people coming into the marketplace in Melbourne. So really we've got a unique proposition at the moment if we are property investors to consider getting into the Melbourne marketplace before the next wave of major migration recommences into Australia. And when we look at the population figures of both Sydney and Melbourne, there are some interesting milestones. Now, remember, Sydney typically is a leading indicator property market to Melbourne. What do I mean by that? Well, quite often, because Sydney has been a more populated area, uh, Typically, house prices and real estate prices have climbed faster in Sydney to uh, their critical median high point. Melbourne is the lag indicator, Sydney the lead indicator. So what Sydney does, Melbourne follows. Really, there is no other marketplaces in Australia that you can compare either Sydney or Melbourne to. You can't really compare Melbourne to Brisbane or even Sydney to Brisbane. It's an unfair comparison because... Only Sydney and Melbourne are global cities in our region. And of course, because they are global, they are fairly similar in many respects, particularly with much of the older established marketplace. So here's some interesting stats, right? Melbourne reached 2 million people in 1975, but Sydney did it in 1959. Melbourne reached 4 million people in 2009, Sydney did that in 1999, right? 5 million people, Melbourne, 
uh, did it in 2018, Sydney 2016. So you can see the, the speed of what is occurring in the Melbourne property market pace, the Melbourne landscape. And of course, being the largest urban landmass, this is so interesting to me because I know Melbourne will become what London is. The question for you is, are you going to bite the bullet and get some of the Melbourne property market in you? Because can you imagine if you were a property investor in England and you didn't buy London when it was affordable? Today, London is completely ridiculously unaffordable. And for many property investors over there, they rue the fact they never bought in Notting Hill or Lab Ladbroke Grove or Chelsea when they could. They never played the Monopoly game. They rushed off to weird little towns and uh, lo and behold, the commerce of London shone through years later and uh, today, of course, a very unaffordable marketplace, one of the most unaffordable in the world. Will Melbourne do that? Well, absolutely in critical places and it's those critical places I think we should be investing in right now which I'll talk to you about. Six million people, when will that happen? Well, here's the thing. Both uh, cities, being Melbourne and Sydney, will reach the milestone of six million people in 2025. And in 2026, Melbourne will become the most populated landmass uh, in Australia. The biggest landmass and the most populated. Interesting, right? So there is some correlation when we look at the... Uh, time that Melbourne, uh, you know, experiences catching up to Sydney in median value. Now, when we look at the lag and leading indicator, there's usually anywhere from three to five years between Melbourne catching up to Sydney values. So if we went back to, say, 2005, the median house price of Sydney was 500000 uh, It was literally 2010 when Melbourne reached that milestone. 2015, the average median property value or house price value in Sydney was nine thirty. dollars In 2020, Melbourne reached that milestone. Right now, um, uh, in... Uh, Melbourne is kind of on its way to reaching a new milestone. In June 2020, the median house price for Sydney was $1,040,000. It is projected by the end of the year, the median house price of Melbourne in 2021 will be uh, around $1,040,000. odd thousand dollars. So you can see the speed of what is occurring in Melbourne. Melbourne is fast catching Sydney's median house price, but arguably Sydney is pulling away again. And this is, again, this push-me-pull-me effect of, of the two marketplaces. Sydney is projected to reach $1.4 million dollars as a median property value according to domain and ANZ and this is a great signal for future growth in Melbourne. However, what we can allude to from this data is both Sydney and Melbourne are pulling away from the pack when it comes to real estate values and unless you buy in the good pockets of both those cities, it's going to be very hard to circle back as a property investor, say, into 2023, 2024, 2025. It may actually just not be practical to buy in either Sydney or Melbourne by then. Meaning, if you are building a portfolio, you're going to have to resign yourself to other big cities, places like Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, Hobart, to own real estate. Now, again, I think this is a critical juncture in, of course, the idea of owning real estate and building a portfolio. Uh, arguably, you can always circle back to Adelaide. You can always circle back to Perth. But you are at a critical period right now in 2021 where potentially you cannot circle back to Melbourne if you don't get a piece of it. Now, to put that in context, I like to teach the Mark Foy effect. Yes, the Mark Foy effect. What is 
the Mark Foy effect. Well, about 130 years ago, there was a retailer. His name was Mark Foy. And he opened a chain of department stores, Mark Foy's. And here in Australia, Mark Foy's was the go-to shopping uh, centre for many people, right? And today, really, uh, Mark Foy's no longer exists as a department store. We're only left with David Jones and Myers, which was formerly Grace Brothers, which was my old mate, Teddy Grace. Um, Mark Foy's opened a soup uh, department store in Melbourne and Sydney. He opened a department store in the walkable suburb from the CBD of Collingwood, Melbourne and Surrey Hills, Sydney. Now, today, to buy a two-bedroom apartment at a median value in Surrey Hills, Sydney, you're going to be paying around $1.2 million. To buy a two-bedroom apartment in Collingwood, Melbourne, you're going to be paying a median price of around $720,000. That is a big gap because fundamentally the history of those suburbs are very, very similar. Walkable to the city, old, beautiful, historical buildings, uh, very similar working class model which got gentrified and today uh, some of the sort of Chardonnay millionaires of society live in these beautiful, historical, walkable suburbs to the city. We know uh, some of those, you know, terrace homes in those areas have gone on to be formidable property investments. But what is so interesting is this Sydney-Melbourne price gap. Even though the history is very shared, the price gap is uh, a leading indicator from Sydney, a lag indicator from Melbourne. Really what that teaches me is if we can find some of these interesting dynamics, we can make money out of it as a property investor. Of course, Melbourne traditionally is Australia's number one university uh, marketplace. And of course, we know our, uh, our basically our immigration works off universities. And Melbourne is home to Australia's best ranked university, the University of Melbourne, ranked 33rd in the world. And of course, that is a big draw card for overseas students to enter the Australian migration system. And of course, build up muscle when it comes to being a smart economy. Melbourne is really a smart economy with uh, fundamentally uh, another 2 million jobs earmarked for the the economy, right? Another actually 2.7 million more jobs earmarked for the economy by 2031. Now, again, think about that. That's ridiculous, right? How many economies in Australia can boast that they're going to turn on another 2.7 million more jobs by 2031? This is incredible. Now, obviously, the biggest challenge in the Melbourne property market is this one in 100 year event called coronavirus, which has come along and spoiled the party when it came to the rents in Melbourne. Now, prior to coronavirus, the vacancy rate in Melbourne was really low, anywhere from 1.6 to 1.9%. To understand vacancy rates, uh, literally you work off a 3% is a balanced market. Anything below 3%, the landlord is in charge. Anything above 3%, the tenant is in charge. Prior to coronavirus, the landlords were very much in charge in Melbourne. Today, Melbourne's vacancy rate is a little bit higher, closer to uh, just over 4%. So the tenants are in charge. Why is this occurring? Well, of course, we have the absentee student market. And really, for many parts of Melbourne where traditional Melbourne people want to live, uh, the vacancy rate is a lot lower. It's much higher where the students are typically living. And the students are typically living uh, in that CBD marketplace. So if you look around, for example, the CBD of Melbourne, you're going to see vacancy rates at like 12 and 13%. And of course, for most Australian property investors, typically staying out of the CBD, unless it's the prestige market, 
is pretty common. Not too many property. I wouldn't know one property investor with a CBD apartment. I would not know one. And I've literally helped thousands of people buy real estate. So even though the vacancy rate is a little bit higher than what would typically be the market normal for Melbourne, should there be the student market open, uh, because the students aren't there, it is having a bit of an effect on the rental marketplace. Students, CBD dwellers aren't about, and of course, this is uh, putting pressure on the overall yield. Today, the market yield for Melbourne sits just under 4%, which is pretty good considering what Melbourne has gone through. And again, if you've got the visibility to go, well, this is just a short-term situation. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, who could have thought what was going to happen happened when it come, came to contagion? Uh, and you can uh, see, I guess, past the short-term challenges. You can really set yourself up with a pretty good property opportunity in Melbourne today. In fact, Melbourne's vacancy rate is actually hot. Uh, Mel Melbourne's overall yield is better than Sydney's yield, which is interesting. And a lot of that also has to deal with the fact that Melbourne and Sydney are just a little bit more expensive than, say, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth, where today um, the average yield of Melbourne is 3.9%, um, Sydney 3.5%. So that's the gross yield on, for example, the unit marketplace. So you can still get a really good yield in many parts of Melbourne, um, closer to 45 even 5%. Just got to know where to look, right? So interesting uh, dynamic. When it comes to liquidity, I think Melbourne is probably one of the best bets you can bet on. Now, remember, in real estate, there are kind of four risks that you have to take into consideration. Market risk, liquidity risk, operational risk and insurance risk. When it comes to the big four, Melbourne ticks a lot of boxes and in particular li liquidity. So what is liquidity risk? Liquidity risk is you buy a property and you can't sell it. So you have to lower the price and give it away and you lose money. That is liquidity risk. When it comes to Australia, we have some big cities that have the opportunity to be very liquid. When you go into smaller communities, they become less liquid. What does that fundamentally mean? Well, nine years out of 10, there just isn't enough demand. And so if you want to sell the real estate, there is just less buyers, right? And think about regional towns or small town centers or smaller cities. Um, really, uh, nine years out of 10, there may only be one person interested in buying the property you have for sale. However, the bigger the city, the more demand and fundamentally the more liquidity. And of course, you measure that by days on market, but also auction clearance rates. And typically the marketplaces with the biggest auction clearance rate is Sydney and Melbourne. In fact, most properties that are sold in Sydney and Melbourne are sold by auction. So why would a real estate agent even do that? Well, a real estate agent does that because Sydney and Melbourne just has so much demand. And if you put 10 people in a room and make them battle over one property, you are seeing liquidity at work. And the best part about the Melbourne property market, in my view, is just how liquidable it is. You can take a property to market. If you time it really well, you can potentially earn up to 20% more than the property is worth. It's not uncommon in Melbourne to see properties sell for 20% above the reserve at auction, liquidity. There is very little liquidity risk in the Melbourne property market, even compared to, for example, uh, bigger cities like Perth or Adelaide, where fundamentally, again, nine years out of 10, there just isn't the population density to battle it out at auction. So you often see those marketplaces, uh, they, they, they sell by private treaty because there is no liquidity through the auction system. I love the auction system because the day you retire, you may just pick up another 100 grand or 200 grand more than you thought you were going to get because of 
the density of Melbourne and the fact that uh, there's just more people usually for properties, for sa- uh, more people than there are properties for sale and more people than there are very good properties for sale, which is the best part, I think, of the Melbourne marketplace. When we map Melbourne, it's interesting, right? So when we think about the marketplaces in Melbourne, um, obviously, often people say to me, you know, should I buy in the Melbourne market? Well, the Melbourne market's huge. The land market, the secondhand market, the housing market, the unit market. What particular market are you talking about? Now, I like to break it down into a couple of behavioral dynamics. You've got the CBD itself, which typically most property investors don't buy. If you want to drop a couple of million, there's some really good streets in the CBD where you can potentially pick up um, absolutely uh, some great real estate, which will go on to make you even more money. Uh, places like Spring Street in the CBD, the Paris Quarter of the CBD. Again, if you've got millions to spend, absolutely cracking areas. Then you've got your walkable areas, places like Richmond, Collingwood, Fitzroy, which are just absolutely great for that almost like historical play when it comes to property investing. Then you've got these this idea that the haves or the most livable areas are typically in that inner or middle ring. So you've got the inner north, inner east, inner west, and the bayside precincts of Melbourne, which are all designed around lifestyle choices. And generally, you can see that through the transport of those areas being connected to the tram, light transit, and uh, they are very good marketplaces to buy. But again, for many of those areas, investors have already missed the boat. This is the problem with the Melbourne marketplace. If you want to buy in Hawthorne, you've got to drop some money, right? If you want to buy even in Yarraville in the inner west of Melbourne, you've got to drop some money. So again, there's probably uh, a, a real challenge on the hands of property investors. If you don't buy in the next couple of years, you're going to miss the boat. And generally, a lot of property investors who are short of a few bob are being pushed out to the outer north, outer east, outer west. And again, those areas probably a little bit different to some of the more brand name suburbs of Melbourne. You can certainly make money in all parts of Melbourne if you understand what you're doing. But if we are playing the Monopoly board, we probably want to jump around that Monopoly board and, and end up with the better pockets if we can and As prices are climbing, some of those better pockets are disappearing. Traditionally, if you don't understand the Melbourne property market, usually it's like Sydney um, or Brisbane. The eastern suburbs are more expensive than the western suburbs. Um, By way of example, you could buy in Melbourne's third most uh, livable suburb, a suburb called Armadale. Uh, It's 10 k's from the CBD. It's in that middle ring. The average house price there, 2.5. Uh, 2 million or you could go to Yarraville which is 10 kilometers from the CBD as well but it's in the western suburbs and the average house price around $950,000. Again um, you can see the difference typically Melbourne historically um, went east when people um, first developed Melbourne and it is the oldest precinct and the most expensive precinct. As you go west, things get cheaper. The inner west is good value, no different to the inner west of uh, Sydney as well. So interesting, when it comes to how Melbourne works, it is a big landmass, right? And for Victorians, 75% of Victorians actually live in Melbourne. Now compare that to Sydney, only 63% of Sydney siders or, or sorry, New South Welsh people live in Sydney. And for Queenslanders, only 48% of Queenslanders live in Brisbane. So completely different marketplaces. Brisbane has to compete with the Gold Coast. Sydney has to compete with Newcastle. Melbourne traditionally has been an absolute stalwart of where people can still find value and drift in to find jobs. Hence why it is today the most urban landscape in Australia. And as such, it is now the biggest CBD in Australia. If you look at 
Melbourne skyscraper count, it's at 47 skyscrapers. Sydney, only 36 skyscrapers. So when you look at the panoramic view of, of Melbourne, it is a Goliath, the actual CBD. Uh, compare that to Perth. There's four skyscrapers in Perth, 47 skyscrapers in Melbourne, and it is on its way to 67 skyscrapers. It is truly our biggest CBD, which is just amazing. When you map out the livability of Melbourne, it's really the most livable suburbs are still those inner and mid middle and early outer ring suburbs of Melbourne. And of course, I think from a property investment point of view, if we can get that inner, middle or early outer ring area, we're going to do very, very well. Um, I think, again, um, Melbourne is transforming and as such, we just need to be mindful of what are new areas and what are old established areas. If we look at Melbourne on a map and you look at it from an aerial point of view at scale, it dwarfs its Victoria's other cities. It dwarfs Geelong. It dwarfs Ballarat. I'd encourage you to go do it. Go Google Melbourne's uh, landmass and see what it looks like compared to Ballarat. Ballarat is like a, a speckle compared to just how big Melbourne is. And the future of Melbourne is even bigger. It's going to add around another 25% more of its landmass. So Melbourne is going to sprawl even further and further afield. And again, I think this gives us really good clues as a property investor as to how to invest. Because if Melbourne is going to get wider, then real estate closer in is just going to get more valuable. But certainly, if we look at where Melbourne is, is drifting to, um, there is more land communities being opened up in the southeast, in the north, and into the western corridor of Melbourne. And of course, this is all to do with the fact that first home buyers and migra migrants do not bring homes with them. They need absolutely more stock to, uh, to, to, to live in as our population swells. And of course, when we look at um, the new growth areas of Melbourne, population growth areas of Melbourne, you might notice that um, they tend to be in these sprawling communities to the southeast, to the north, and to the west. Generally, how it works in Melbourne, the southeast is more popular than the north and then the west. Um, the lowest socioeconomic is the lower um, or, or to, the, uh, to the emerging communities to the west of Melbourne. So when we look at the employment nodes of Melbourne, other than the CBD, we've got new employment nodes being um, uh, established through Plan Melbourne in Monash, which is, is to the southeast, in Dandenong to the southeast. Then we've got new um, areas of work and employment around Parkville, which is really where the hospital precincts of Melbourne are, Latrobe, where the um, great university precincts are in Melbourne, and Sunshine, which is kind of like that working class middle pocket of Melbourne. And then to the, the west, we've got just the one in East Werribee, which again is going to be a major employment node. So Melbourne's traditional employment nodes are pretty well established middle um, and inner ring pockets of Melbourne. And this again gives us clues that really the job centres of Melbourne are closer to the inner and middle pockets of Melbourne, really from the city centre itself to around sort of 25 kilometres from the CBD. That's where people work in Melbourne. So if we want to own real estate, perhaps that 25 kilometre area or area or into the city is really probably where we should put our money um, and own real estate, right? Now, the coolest part, I think, about Melbourne's infrastructure plan is its $54 billion spend on connecting its rail system around Melbourne. Uh, the, the Melbourne loop is going to game change Melbourne. Now, if you've ever travelled to London. One of the best things about London is you don't need a car and you can get the tram. I think it's amazing. You can get, uh, sorry, the, the tube. You can get the tube, right? The tube, you can go from A to Z. 
you literally can hop across um, the train line uh, of of London, and literally you you can connect and zigzag across from A to Z. Traditionally, train lines in Australia are pretty one dimensional. In other words, you can only go on that line, and you can't necessarily cross over unless you come into a junction. And typically, those junctions are in the CBD. Melbourne is creating like a circle loop and it is the biggest infrastructure spend in Australia. And what it's going to do, it's going to open much of these employment clusters and this middle ring marketplace to uh, a loop line. So it means that you don't have to come into the city to then go out to the north. The north can go to the, to the south, the north can go to the west. And you've got to have this really good loop connecting to... Melbourne's airport. Melbourne's airport today is actually Australia's biggest curfew-free airport, handles a lot of freight, a lot of logistics. Um, the challenge with Melbourne's airport is it's pretty far away from the southeast pocket of Melbourne. And so this loop line is going to go from the southeast all the way around to the airport. And it's going to pass through many, many different neighborhoods, which are, are going to connect them again to commerce. Now, remember... Commerce gets off the train. Demand gets off the train. And if you want to understand a little bit about town planning, I've done a podcast in the past on town planning. Jump on that. It'll give you some insights as to why uh, infrastructure like this is so important for property investors to jump on. Of course, Melbourne is uh, Australia's busiest port as well. So not only is it full of uh, manufacturing jobs, full of logistic jobs, full of airport jobs, full of CBD worker jobs. It's also Australia's biggest link to the outside world when it comes to uh, being uh, a port. So more money pours in through the Victorian port system than you can imagine. It is a beast. So when we think about the market of Melbourne, obviously uh, the market over the long term has been an absolute cracking performer. But of course, many in property investors are infatuated with the short term. What happens tomorrow? What happens next week? Um, obviously, real estate is a long term sport. But if we track the most recent trends in the Melbourne market, really in about 2018, we had a bit of a declining marketplace in Melbourne. There were some local uh, elections. You had the start of the Banking Royal Commission. Uh, there was certainly a little bit more subdued when it came to lending. However, back in 2018, we were tracking that supply levels were falling off a cliff and a lot of that was to do with the Royal Commission and APRA tightening lending. And of course, people who were, could borrow money on 4% home loans at the time being serviced at 8% rates. And of course, that um, created a lack of stock production and as such, we started to see stock levels disappear. Really, probably the bottom of the Melbourne market was, again, that um, findings of, of the Royal Commission. APRA then and went and removed um, lending caps on interest-only loans. They started to ease up money coming back into the marketplace. Remember, probably the best way to understand Melbourne back in 2019 there was no price growth. And of course, all this potentially did was build up a huge surge of growth, which is now unfolding because it was like a bull at the gates that wanted to run, but it couldn't. And again, more energy was being created for this market to take off. And of course, in 2019, we had the great negative gearing scare um, that Bill Shorten was going to remove um, fundamentally uh, gearing benefits from real estate and everyone thought the Labor Party was going to win at that particular stage and um, actually Scott Morrison won the election and uh, that challenge to the property market never unfolded. And of course, this was again like the start of a recovery. We started to see Melbourne's auction clearance rates go back to a new two-year high back in 2019. It was starting to bubble and then, of course, uh, the vacancy rate really started to, to fall away. We started to see a really tight rental market in Melbourne. Um, really, uh, there was a rental crisis unfolding in 2019 in Melbourne. 
Then 2020 hit and we were supposed to have a property bloodbath. And of course, for Melbourne, the biggest challenge was Melbourne was shut for close to four and a half months. So again, there was a, a real challenge of more demand and no stock moving because everyone was at home. There was stay-at-home orders. And by the end of 2020, supply had forward to fell to an 11-year low and stock on the market was ridiculously low. This leads us to where we are today, 2021, and national listings in Melbourne uh, in particular are down. There's no stock on the market and there's just a bucket load of demand. One of the biggest demand pools of people is coming from that first homeowner market and really around 20% of buyers in Melbourne are coming out of the first home buyer marketplace. Again, this is a big statistic because what it actually tells us is the first home buyers are absorbing to traditionally what the investors want to buy. First home buyers buy $500,000 real estate, uh, investors buy $500,000 real estate. And again, you're seeing this really strong demand in the marketplaces. Uh, most of Australia at the moment is growing in value. There's a lot of equity coming out of the marketplaces. And again, really the question for property investors is, well, we could probably make money in the emerald property market today because it's a rising market. But are we actually better off getting into Melbourne before it becomes too late to own real estate as an investor? Certainly many owner-occupiers are always going to own real estate in Melbourne and Sydney um, and pay the $1.2, $1.4 million price tag to own real estate in those marketplaces. But the argument it is, where is the cutoff point for A and B grade real estate in Melbourne as an investor? And of course, if we look at many of the banks, they're predicting uh, high price movement in Melbourne. Uh, ANZ, you know, 8%, NAB, 14%, Commonwealth Bank, 12%, Westpac, 18%. Huge amounts of growth coming into the predicted housing and property market in Melbourne. Melbourne house prices are tipped to reach the highest price in, uh, in, in a decade, right? Like it is growing really quickly. Literally, the Melbourne property market went from doom to gloom um, or doom to boom rather in really the last quarter of last year and this first three months of 2021 has been spectacular when it comes to price movement in Melbourne. Literally, people are lining up around the corner for the best pockets of Melbourne. Uh, you can Google a good little domain article. It's like being on King Street on a Saturday night. Melbourne buyers in inspection frenzy. And there's a great photo of literally hundreds of buyers lining up to go and look at an apartment in Hawthorne amazing scenes. So when it comes to dwelling dynamics, um, I like to teach a few fundamentals around Melbourne. Over the next uh, 30 years, Melbourne requires another 1.5 million more dwellings. What that looks like is 530,000 detached houses, 480,000 apartments and 560,000 townhouses, right? So Think about that for a minute, right? If we do not make some good commercial decisions around where we're going to invest and what we're going to buy, we are going to compete with another 1.57 million more dwellings. And again, a lot of those dwellings are going to go in emerging communities where potentially uh, people are just starting out um, when it or those areas are just starting out as new precincts. They were once cow paddocks, now they're new precincts. So interesting watching Melbourne unfold and how to play the game of monopoly in the Melbourne property market. Now, I always teach the Forex growth plan that making money out of real estate is done in four different ways. Buying well, choosing a great location, choosing a great market. Obviously, Melbourne's a, 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 a sensational market over the long term. And behavioural growth, things like buying, um, you know, next to a wellness community or buying really good design or influencing growth through mobility or proximity or lifestyle. But today we're going to concentrate on Melbourne's locational marketplaces. And I break down location into four sections. 
place economy, land gentrification, rare real estate, the aspirational middle ring, and also not in my backyard areas. So Melbourne certainly has um, some different marketplaces. And really the new housing marketplaces are in certain pockets, new uh, growth zones, new communities, which are generally found in, in the north of Melbourne, in the uh, western corridor of Melbourne or the southeast corridor of Melbourne. When it comes to new housing, obviously you can knock down rebuild in middle ring Melbourne and get that kind of rare earth strategy, but you're in it for maybe 1, 1.2, 1.5. When it comes to new housing, you can certainly go out to the growth zones of Melbourne where there's high population growth earmarked for Plan Melbourne. And again, um, you're probably entering, say, the Western Corridor of Melbourne at circa 550, the Northern Corridor circa 650 to 700, and the Southeast Corridor, which is typically the most popular at sort of anywhere from sort of 650 to 750 for a really good home. You will be sort of 40 kilometres from the CBD, right? So again, when we look at the land corridors of Melbourne, we need to be really specific as to how we go and buy in those neighbourhoods. And I've done a really good podcast on understanding the land or house and land market. I encourage you to listen to that to understand how we create a pincer movement around buying land in these new growth zones, which typically houses have never been before, right? So it's a a, a big conversation as to how to go and approach buying real estate there, but you can certainly make money in the Melbourne house and land marketplace. And of course, when we look at the finance approvals, a lot of it's to do with buying new properties in these emerging communities so people can live the great Australian dream. When it comes to established property in Melbourne, established housing, again, you're probably going to have to drop well and truly over a million dollars if you want to get into the inner or middle ring housing marketplace. Um, and very good marketplaces. Again, a lot of property investors uh, probably are not capable of leveraging that amount of money to get into those marketplaces. And the challenge, of course, in those middle ring marketplaces where the established market has already boomed and already gone up in value... Uh, you're, you're fundamentally just paying a higher price. And of course, depending if you've got the money or not, if you've got the money, I think it's a great move. But uh, for most people I find who are investing, they're sort of spending that four, five, six, seven, and really the established housing market has bolted for the most part in inner and middle Melbourne. When it comes to the townhouse marketplace um, or terrace house marketplace, brand new terrace house marketplace as, op as opposed to the historical terrace house marketplace. Really, um, when we look at how that works in Melbourne, most of it is being pushed into these new growth zone corridors. Uh, fundamentally, you know, 25, 30 kilometres from the CBD. Uh, and of course, what that means is if we can find something more central it's going to have a lot of value because when we look at the supply of dwellings coming through, we can see that most of that supply is actually um, fundamentally being pushed further and further out. And of course, if we can get some new stock or newer stock into the inner or middle ring, it's going to be highly valuable for us as a property investor. But again, it comes with a little bit of a price tag to it. So when it comes to the apartment market, it's interesting in Melbourne. I'm a big believer actually in the Melbourne apartment apartment market and I'll explain to you why. Um, it's a very interesting set of dynamics over the years. So when it comes to apartments, there's kind of like two ways to buy real estate in Melbourne. You can be a not in my backyard buyer and buy in a prestige suburb where there's a big variation between house prices and apartment prices or you can do this sort of place economy dynamic. Now, Melbourne's completions over the years are said to be at a record low in 2022. As we all understand, really, Melbourne um, was at a, in a stay-at-home order in 2020, so stock production really fell off a cliff. Then prior to 2020, from about 2017 to 2000, 
and 19, you had this kind of royal commission and no stock production was created. So if we look at um, Melbourne's uh, really future completions, it's ridiculously low. And uh, what that does mean is there will be uh, a real challenge, I think, when it comes to the future of rental um, properties in Melbourne. They're, they're disappearing and the future of um, really good apartments in Melbourne. There just isn't enough of them. So if we start with the not in my backyard market, which just fundamentally is really rich suburbs where people are rich and, um, you know, you can you can buy houses for you know, a gazillion dollars. It's very interesting. If we were to look at, for example, Turak, Melbourne's most uh, expensive marketplace by, uh, by scale and size, you know, the average home's 4.1 million. But you can pick up an apartment for 950. There's a three million two hundred and thirty-one thousand dollar variation in in the not in my backyard marketplaces. So I'm a big believer in the NIMBY suburbs of Melbourne, and obviously the horses bolted with the housing market in those areas. But when I analyze the 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 difference in value between the house price of those rich people living in those suburbs and the apartment market it's absolutely good value the argument of course is will the rich um, older people in those areas eventually downsize from their luxury homes and live local and of course as we know um, people tend to uh, be creatures of habit and of course live in those local neighbourhoods for up to 50 years and many people do transfer from those richer houses to the smaller dwellings and of course that pushes the prices up. So I think there's really good value in NIMBY Melbourne. And when I look at NIMBY Sydney, um, absolutely apartments are double the price, right? So if we went to, um, if we went to for example, Rose Bay, uh, Rose Bay, a beautiful sort of harbour suburb of Melbourne, uh, sorry, of Sydney, uh, the apartment price of Rose Bay on average is $1.5 million. If we went to um, another sort of really beautiful Melbourne suburb, um, Brighton, which is by the sort of sea, the average unit price in Brighton, $970,000, right? So look at the difference. Rose Bay, $1.5 Brighton, uh, $970,000. Big, big difference when it comes to the value proposition of NIMBY in Sydney versus NIMBY in Melbourne. NIMBY in Melbourne is underpriced and you can go to places like Hawthorne, for example, and the median unit market is $600,000. Hawthorne is a top 10 suburb in Melbourne. Again, looking at this from a Sydney's perspective, Melbourne is going to be priced out. These A-grade areas are going to go. When we look at the place economy suburbs, I've done a great podcast on the place economy. Go back and listen to it. Place economy is all about the idea that human beings absolutely love urbanity. And when you think about the big drivers in society today, it's culture, it's uh, tree change and sea change. The big cultural places where really these areas are are not suburbs, they're places people want to go there to hang out, people want to go to Fitzroy and, and shop and be part of the night culture. They're not just dormitory neighbourhoods where people come and go from them, they are places, places where people want to meet each other, places where people want to go on a date with each other. The great 20 place economy suburbs are also um, fantastic areas to invest in. And of course, they are the areas with the most people per square metre. In other words, they're the most dense areas. And again, what this does is it creates this effect that more people want to live there, more people want to be part of that place, and they be just become more valuable over time. When we look at the great place suburbs, there are some very good ones which are still affordable. However, many of them, the horses bolted. And today, to buy there and get a really good property is uh, very expensive, right? And so um, when we look at the top 20 place economy neighbourhoods of Melbourne, around 50% of them are still good value 
and available for, for property investors. What will happen in three or four years' time? I guess they'll be priced out. And uh, again, you won't own real estate in Surrey Hills of Melbourne. It, most people can't afford real estate in the Surrey Hills of Sydney today. Again, in Melbourne, it's still possible, but it's hanging on by a thread. Now, I think the most interesting thing about Melbourne's real estate marketplace, particularly the apartment marketplace, is Plan Melbourne itself. In 2017, Plan Melbourne got updated. And in April 2017, literally three years ago, um, sorry, four years ago, Melbourne's apartment market got turned upside down. There was a concept brought into Melbourne's apartment market called the Better Design Standards. And it game changed the apartment market for Melbourne for me. Prior to 2017, as a dealmaker going to Melbourne for two decades, I never got involved in the Melbourne property marketplace apartment market. One of the reasons I didn't was prior to April 2017, the previous town plan of Melbourne was fundamentally flawed. It basically allowed for really terrible apartments to be built. Then if I was to go back even further, really going back to say the 1970s and 50-year-old real estate, uh, there were some, some good um, bits around, but again, when you did your capital improvements cost, started to not work, right? And if we look at literally the last 50 years of apartments in Melbourne, the stock has been fundamentally uh, ordinary. And this again is an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity. If we go back to the 1970s now, good apartments, but again, probably past their use by date. If we go back to the 1980s, um, apartments, uh, those sort of typical red brick walk-ups, probably past their use by date. And then in the early 2000s, we had this kind of weird mishmash of medium high rises which kind of suck right and in the 2010s melbourne's town plan was flawed right melbourne literally had tiny apartments which which would be illegal in tokyo let alone australia melbourne had this fascination with pushing density of really compact stock Two bedroom apartments, the second bedroom had no natural light. One bedroom apartments were literally so small that uh, you wouldn't want to buy them. And when you compared them to cities like Sydney or Melbourne or Newcastle, there was just no argument. You would not buy that stock. So the best thing about the Melbourne ap apartment market is for the last 50 years, really, stock is just shit and terrible. And things have changed, which is just creating this value proposition that I'm in love with. Because uh, if we take away the capital costs to improve the 1970s, 1980s and 1990s stock, which, um, you know, you've just got to inject money into and some of it you can't even fix, then you're left with the 2000 stock, which is a bit wishy-washy, to be honest with you. And then the 2010 stock... Literally from about 2006 to about 2017, you fundamentally had really small apartments being produced. So what does that actually mean? Well, uh, apartments that have been completed since 2009, around 145,000 apartments, all flawed. Then in 2019, the new apartment standards got approved and this tiny apartment market disappeared. Again, just better sizes, better designs, better green space, better amenity, all pushed into the apartment section. And of course, for developers, they had to manoeuvre and build better design standards. And from really 2018, after the April 2017 approval, we started to see a better supply chain of stock. And that stock really didn't appear until 2000, late 2018, 2019 when the new town plan got 
produce. So think about that. We've literally got around two years worth of really awesome apartments in Melbourne dating back to 2019. The previous decade, terrible. And then you're dealing with much older real estate. And of course, in real terms, that was Old Town Plan, a one-bedroom, 42 square metres, um, 5.6 metre frontage, uh, 7.5 metre width uh, or length. Today, that same property would need to be 8.2 metres long and 6.1 metres wide and, of course, 50 square metres internally or minimum. So what does that actually mean? Well, from a behavioural point of view, arguably since the year of the Art Deco period of apartments in Melbourne, uh, apartments have not been a flight to quality dynamic, meaning there has been no quality supply. So when you think about undersupply, Melbourne's already undersupplied, but when you think about undersupply of quality, it's completely undersupplied. Meaning, really post-2017, uh, the supply of really well quality stock is 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 very low, right? So we've literally got two or three years of amazing apartments in Melbourne, and really you could probably go back fifty years before you find another really good quality period of apartments. So what is that actually transpiring to? Well, we're seeing really beautiful design properties be uh, be really accepted by the market and people absolutely paying a premium for it. We had one client buy um, under the Newtown plan, um, grabbed a, a, a just a, a one-bedroom for 521 2019 just last month sold it for 643 uh, So they traded, they did the flip, and of course back when they were buying, they didn't have to pay stamp duty because there was kind of like this concession under that um, – period of time so they pocketed about 120 odd thousand bucks on a property which again um was was under the new new guidelines of design and of course there's just not that stock around so it's amazing i think it's a really cool opportunity because they're just literally you've got around two years worth of competition as opposed to 50 years worth of competition and when you start to look at the new design stock and you see the photography of it, absolutely amazing. So uh, my good mate, Dr. Andrew Wilson of My Housing Market has a great piece of data showing what marketplaces are balanced, oversupplied or undersupplied. According to him, Melbourne, most undersupplied market in Australia. And for me, that's amazing when you actually tie in some town planning to the Melbourne undersupply and the history of Melbourne and start to understand what it all means, you can definitely find strong demand in many neighbourhoods, low stock supply, low great stock supply. And of course, all that means is a shortage and shortages means price increases. My conclusion to the Melbourne property market, really not since 2014 have we been seeing uh, such growth rates. Melbourne is significantly undersupplied. There's upward pressure in the marketplace. Sentiment has improved since the lockdown period in 2020. It's dramatically changed. And of course, what this really means is Melbourne is rising in value. And because it's rising in value, it is a threat to people who are not um, yet investors in Melbourne because the brand name areas, the areas that Melbourne people traditionally like are disappearing. And of course, what this may mean is Melbourne ends up rather like Sydney where the best pockets of Sydney have long since gone uh, rather like back in 2015. You really had to buy the best parts of Sydney or, uh, you know, use it or lose it, so to speak. Melbourne's going through this kind of uh, metamorphosis and I certainly think if you do have the capacity to invest, you should really consider some of the middle, inner or early outer rings, ring areas of Melbourne and uh, use some of the philosophies which I'm sharing today. Hey, thanks for your time. I hope you've enjoyed the podcast. If you'd love to leave me a review, I'd love to get one. Um, thanks for listening. It's been a long one today. Put me in double speed. I should have said that at the beginning, shouldn't I? Um, maybe... I don't know. Anyway, should we have done the episode? Was it worthwhile? I hope so. Thanks for listening. I'm off. 
I'll catch you soon on the next episode of The Urban Property Investor. Thanks for tuning in to The Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of The Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.